day five, church, and I pray that you will continue in this fast. I'm really excited about what God is doing in my life and also in those who are fasting with us. I've heard you know many testimonies already of just the Spirit of God dealing with people's lives and just conforming them more into the image of Christ. And by this time, you should be experiencing a strong, strong presence of the Holy Spirit. And like I shared on the first uh, day, the communion or the fellowship of the Holy Spirit should be so rich in your life by this time that you're writing down everything that God is speaking to you, what He wants to do in you, through you, your family, your friends, your purpose, the vision that God has for you, your calling, your gifts, all that the Holy Spirit brings to the surface and encourages you and focuses you back on the Lord Jesus Christ because that's what it's all about, focusing on Christ and what He did on the cross and us accomplishing not our will, but His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So fasting does not really change God. God cannot be changed. Fasting changes us. It changes our disposition. It makes us more humble. It shows us what God wants us to do, things in our lives that need to be dealt with. So fasting is not a way to twist God's arm to get Him to do what He doesn't want to do. God is sovereign. But what it does do, it changes us into the image of Christ. So now we align ourselves with what God wants to do in our lives. So that's the main problem of the church. Not that God does not want to move, but are we in a position of humility and brokenness that God can move through us? A lot of times it's just too much flesh for God to move, and God won't move because the Bible says no, that no flesh should glory in His uh, presence. God gets all the glory and honor and praise, and that's what He wants to bring our church. Anyway, this morning I want to talk to you about overcoming temptation. Now, temptation is not sin. A lot of people feel like if I'm getting tempted, I'm having all these, you know, ungodly thoughts, you know, all these thoughts of anger in my mind, and why am I thinking this way? Maybe I'm not saved, you know, and that is just the enemy putting those thoughts in your mind. So temptation is not sin. The Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all points, yet without sin. Sin is when we fall into the temptation, or we give in to the temptation, which is disobedience towards God. But being tempted to disobey God is not disobedience. You're just being tempted. Now, if you do disobey, that's when you fall into sin. So I want to show you uh, how temptation works. James chapter 1, verse 13 through 15. It says, starting at verse 13, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does He tempt anyone. So whenever you're being tempted to do evil, you can't look up to heaven and say, God, why are you tem tempting me to do evil? Oh Lord, it is your fault. Why are you putting me in this position? You know, James says here, it's not God's fault. God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does He tempt anyone to do something wrong or to, or to sin against Him. That's not God. And now in verse 14, it gives us the answer. But each one is tempted when... By his own evil desires. If we were in church, I would have told you to repeat that. My own evil desire. He is dragged away and enticed or deceived. So every temptation has to do with your own evil desires. In other words, desires of the sinful nature, like I taught in previous lessons. We all have a sinful nature. Because Satan would bring to you or tempt you with whatever your sinful nature used to engage with in the past. So it's your own evil desire. So it's not even Satan himself. Satan tempts you with that which your flesh desires. If your flesh doesn't desire it, he's not going to bring it to you because if not, it's not going to be a temptation. For example, if you never you know, did drugs or, or, or crack cocaine or any of those heavy drugs, he's not going to tempt you with that because it's not a temptation for you. But if someone else that struggled with that in the past and now has been delivered by the power of the Holy Spirit, he might tempt them with that and for them is a temptation. Or if a person was an alcoholic in the past, you know, he will tempt them with that whenever he's stressed out or going through a hard time and things doesn't seem to go his way. Satan will whisper in his ear, why don't you have a drink? It will make things better. And from there on, they will go on a binge on drinking. So temptation, it's only... A temptation when your flesh desires it. So every, each one of us should know what Satan is going to tempt us with. 
because each one of us should know our own weaknesses. Listen, church, we've been living with ourselves, from some of us for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. We've been living with ourselves. We know ourselves well. So we know what we're weak in and what the enemy is going to bring to try to tempt us. A person that struggles in the past being greedy with money you know, and, and wanting more and more and more, he's going to tempt them and put them in positions that he can be greedy with money. His flesh is going to cater to that. His flesh is going to desire it. So each one is tempted by his own evil desires. And then it says he is dragged away and enticed. So the question you have to ask yourself, what desires in me are dragging me away to disobey God? And we all have those desires, you know, and we got to allow the Holy Spirit to control those desires and, and, and set us free from those desires so that we won't act out on it. So we're always going to be tempted. As long as you're breathing on this earth and you're a human being and you can have a heartbeat, you will be tempted. There's not going to be a time in your spiritual life that you're so holy and pure and sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit that now you never get tempted. That does not exist. That's false Christianity. We're going to be tempted as long as we're breathing. The key is not to disobey God when we're tempted. So each one of us should know our own weaknesses. You know, young Christians, they think they're stronger than what they really are. As you mature as a believer, and stronger believers think that they're, they're weaker than what they really are, which is a good thing because when you think you're weaker than what you really are, you stay in the face of God, praying and, and seeking Him and quoting scriptures and depending upon Him completely, knowing that you don't want to offend Him. You don't want to disobey Him. You want to please Him in everything that you do. So keep that in mind. And if you've never done, you know, uh, uh, written down the things that you used to struggle in the past, which, like I said, all of us should be highly aware of our weaknesses. If you had a low self-esteem in the past and don't believe in yourself a lot and you beat yourself down a lot, Satan is going to come around and whisper in your ear, you're not worth it. God does not love you. Look at the mess you're in. And he's always going to try to bring condemnation to feed that insecurity that you had in the past. But you have to understand that the scriptures say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old life has passed away and everything has become new. So don't let the enemy beat you down with the things of the past. And he's going to bring that because he knows once you start thinking those thoughts, it affects your whole mood. It affects your attitude. You start being critical. You start being judgmental and you start believing those lies. So recognize and write down what are the things I used to struggle with because know for sure Satan is going to tempt you with that all over again to keep you bound. So he is dragged away. I love that word. And, and that's how sin is. It, it, it drags you away little by little, pulls on you. You know, the temptation comes, you say no today, and then it comes again tomorrow. And before you know it, you're being dragged away little by little. And then it, it, verse 15 says, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. So the desire, like I said, is not sin in itself. When it's conceived, then it gives birth to sin or it gives birth to disobedience. So now you actually disobey God. So having those thoughts... And being tempted is not disobeying God. But when you actually agree with it and you allow that sin or temptation to drag you away, when it's conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, it gives birth to death. Now let's talk about somebody that persists in that sin, that continues in it. And that sin continues to get stronger in their lives. And, and, and it can, continues to grow in their lives progressively worse and worse and worse and that's why sin always goes from bad to worse and it gets bigger it multiplies and it gets out of control and then in Matthew 26 verse 41 so I just wanted to share with you how temptation works so that you can know yourself and of course by this time during the fast the Holy Spirit has shown you a lot of things about yourself that you might not know about yourself and that is the greatest thing about serving God, that He knows us better than we know ourselves. So as we spend time with the Lord, He reveals us to ourselves, if you know what I mean. As you spend time with Him, you, you begin to see yourself the way God really created you and those things in your life that are hindering you and, and, and stopping you from serving God. 
Because a lot of times we all have blind spots, you know, and, and as we fast and pray, God, by the Holy Spirit, reveals those blind spots and, and shows us, you know, what we're struggling with, what we're weak in, and all these different things. So Matthew 26, 41, how do we overcome temptation? How do we not disobey God when we're being tempted? Jesus gave the answer, verse 41, Matthew 26, 41. Ready? Keep watch and pray. Why he said keep watch and pray? Well, he gives the answer right after that. So that you will not give in to temptation. The spirit is willing, willing for what? To pray. But the body is weak or the flesh is weak. He told the disciples that were sleeping to watch and pray so that they won't give in to the temptation. Not that they won't be tempted, so that they won't give in to the temptation, so that they won't disobey. And that is the key for us. If we want to overcome temptation, you're never going to overcome temptation unless you're living a lifestyle of prayer because prayer releases the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. It releases the anointing of God so that when temptation comes, you have the spiritual strength to resist the temptation. But if you're not praying, Jesus said here, the flesh is weak. The flesh gives into temptation very easily. It, 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 it wants to give into temptation because it's weak. And the only way that we can live according to God's standards and overcome the flesh is by living a lifestyle of prayer. And by this time during the fast, you should feel so strong spiritually as you're praying, as you're reading the Bible, you're feeding your spirit, you know, because uh, fasting, you know, kills the flesh. You know, the flesh don't like when we say we're going to pray and fast. The flesh wants to hang out, eat, watch TV all day, you know, and that's it. So you, by fasting, you're putting the flesh under and, and it doesn't like it. And like I said, you should be feeling stronger spiritually and, and connecting with God more so that when temptation comes, you won't give in to it. And that's why a lot of Christians, unfortunately, fall into temptation and, and all these different great men of God that we've heard in the past. It's not that they didn't love the Lord, it's that they slacked off in their prayer life, their communion with God. God, as we pray, He is our life source. He is our sustenance. When we pray, we connect, we plug in to the power of Almighty God. Without prayer, there is no power. And that's why Satan attacks our prayer life more than anything else. Because if you can get a Christian not praying, he knows that eventually that Christian will start straying. Little by little, he starts getting dragged away by his own desires. And one of the things that Satan uses to keep Christians busy from praying is uh, busyness, distractions, all these different things so that they won't pray. And if you don't pray, you'll never overcome temptation. You'll never accomplish the purposes of God in your life. And he works overtime to try to keep you from that prayer room because he knows that when you enter that prayer room, you come out with power. You come out filled with the Spirit of God. You come out with more vision from God. You, you come out filled with God. And he dreads that with all his heart. And then in James chapter 5, verse 16, it says, The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. The greatest power that we have as believers is the power of prayer. And Satan loves to undermine that. He tells us your prayer is not reaching heaven. God is not listening to you. You're wasting your time. He listens to pastors and other people, but he does not listen to you. And before you know it, he discourages you because he knows that if you plug into God, you're going to maximize your full potential in God. And he doesn't want that. So the, the, the prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. That is one of our spiritual weapons that we have. Prayer. Spending time with God, getting filled with God, you know, sensing the presence of God, and it produces wonderful results. And have you seen already, as we've been fasting and praying, the results that God has been producing in your life already, and what He's doing in you, and how the Holy Spirit has been communing with you, and you've been writing things down. And never allow the enemy to tell you that prayer does not produce anything, that you're wasting your time. And Many Christians I know have allowed the enemy to, to, to lie to them and they don't pray. There's a lot of Christians that don't pray not even 10 minutes a, a day and then they wonder why they're struggling or they keep falling into temptation and why is it so hard as, as a Christian. It should be easier, you know, and the only way 
you're going to live right as a Christian is by living a prayer life, you know, and, and spending that time with the Lord. That's the, your most important time throughout the whole day, even more important than your spouse and your kids and whatever else you do. The most important time is your time in prayer with God. Because when you spend time with God, you become a blessing to other people. When you don't spend time with God, you start resenting other people because they're constantly pulling from you. I want you to do this, want you to do that, and you know, keep you busy. You know, but when you pray, you're more in the spirit, you're more loving, you're more kind, you're more patient. Why? Because you got filled with the Spirit of God. And, and now the, the the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is flowing through you. So we got to get back to that church and hopefully throughout this whole week as we've been praying, we'll continue that. That this is just a springboard. This seven days of fasting will be a springboard for us to continue to live that lifestyle, concentrating on God, spending time in his word. And I encourage you, memorize scripture, speak the word. When temptation comes and, and he's attacking your mind with negativity and, and lies and deception and bringing up your past, you know, what Satan loves to do. Know the scriptures and, and, and look at them and, and begin to speak the, the word of God. Even as Christ spoke the word when Satan tempted him and said, Look, if you are the son of God, turn these stones to make these stones become bread. Jesus said, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every single word that comes out of the mouth of God. So Satan defeated, I mean, Jesus defeated Satan with the word of God. Begin to speak the word of God. When you have those lies in your mind, speak to yourself as you're driving in the car. He who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. You know, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. I have authority over the power of the enemy. You know, if God is for me, who can be against me? As you begin to, to speak that, even though you might not feel it, because we walk by faith, not by sight. As you begin to speak the word of God, your spirit is going to be strengthened and your faith is going to begin to rise up because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You need to learn how to talk to yourself, not in a crazy way, nonsense, like we know some people do, but talk to yourself the word of God. In other words, sometimes we got to preach to ourselves. Sometimes we're telling others what to do. Sometimes we need to preach to ourselves and, and, and look at ourselves and begin to speak the word of God. So I encourage you to continue praying. As you're driving, as, as any little moment you get, talk to the Lord. Bring up your family, you know, that God would save them. Your, your, your sons and daughters, bring them up that God would save them. Bring them before the throne of God. Satan hates that with everything he has because he knows that the only weapon we have as a church is crying out to God. If he can get us fighting with, by other means and worldly weapons, he knows we, we are defeated already. But once we get into our prayer room, Satan trembles in all his demons because he knows that there is power being released and that when we ask God anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we have the petition that we have asked of him. That's in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. Anything we ask according to his will, he hears us. So I encourage you, stay in prayer. Continue to write down everything that God shows you and allow God to transform you. So that's it for this morning, Conquering Temptation. But I want to encourage you to come out tonight, you know, to the women's group that my wife will be holding here. They're going to be a time of just worshiping the Lord and, and praying. You know, and I always say it, the corporate anointing is always greater than the individual anointing. So if you've been sensing the presence of God strong individually, praying on your own and, and, and in the car, putting worship music, when the women get together, the church gets together, the anointing maximizes a hundred times. You're going to sense a strong presence of the Lord and God is going to deal with you corporately as the other women worship and praise God. It's going to be such an, an electricity in the air for you to receive from God and, and allow God to continue to do that work in you corporately. So I can encourage you to come out at 7 p.m. here at my house and if you don't come to our church you know you're still welcome to come email me or email Jen you know and say you know what I want to attend that meeting I want God to move in my life and you'll see as soon as you walk in the presence of the Lord it's going to be so rich that if you missed out you missed out you know sometimes you have to be where God is moving and I love you know in Acts chapter 2 in the upper room there were many people who believed in Christ but the only ones that got filled with the Holy Spirit were the 120 who were in the upper room. You have to be there 
physically. Sometimes, you know, we do Facebook Live and all these different things. It's not the same than being there physically. The only ones that got filled with the Holy Spirit that day were the 120 believers that were there in that physical location with one mind and one heart and one accord. So you need to be here tonight if you want God to continue to do the work that He started in your life in a more profound way. There's power when the church gets together. God bless and hope to see you tonight. And uh, we'll continue. You know, we're coming down to the wire now. We got a couple of more days. And then Sunday morning, we're going to have an, explo an explosion of a service. The presence of God is going to be so rich. I'm just so excited to see what God is going to continue to do. It's, it's, it's a new day in the things of the Lord. And I just thank God for what He's uh, going to do. So I encourage you, continue in the faith, and let's move forward with God. Amen.